Shalom, I'm Rabbi Joseph Batasnik, and welcome to Faith to Faith. No matter what our differences may be, it is our faith that hopefully brings us together to do great things. My guest today is a truly dynamic individual who for more than 30 years has dedicated his life to serving God and his community. The Reverend Michael J. Faulkner founded and currently leads the New Horizon Church of New York in Harlem. Built on the principle of building bridges, between the economically and socially disadvantaged in the name of Christ. He also serves as a board member of the Medicare Rights Center and the Chicago Hope Academy and is the president of the Institute for Leadership. Last year, Reverend Faulkner also founded and serves as CEO of Over the Hump Resources, which provides working capital and management assistance to small and medium businesses worldwide. His 2010 book, Restoring the American Dream, highlights his vision and goals to save the American dream and future for future generations. A former New York Jet football player, he finds spare time to run marathons and also plans to run for mayor of New York in 2017. I welcome the tireless Reverend Michael J. Faulkner. Rabbi, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Well, you've had great success, not necessarily with the Jets, but with all of the other accomplishments <laughs> that you had there. Um, how did you get involved with the Jets? You were selecting the draft? No, I was I was undrafted. You know, in fact, the 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 story, uh, you know, when I got to here for a draft tryout as an undrafted free agent, I was uh, I found out that they had the four All Pro defensive linemen. And that same year, they drafted three, and then they signed two other guys that same year as free agents, both of which had under uh, had uh, training camp NFL training camp experience the year before. So of all of those guys, I was the shortest, I was the <laughs> slowest, I was the, the lightest. I was what they called a 2-2 player. Wow. But at the end of six weeks, I was, uh, I was part of the team. It was, I think it was they could use you again. I think they may, <laughs> they may be calling you this time and draft you. Uh, you know, I often think when we sit on trains, we look straight ahead. We don't look to the right, to the left, to the person near us, uh, and we get off at our stop. Sometimes we go through life the same way. We are living in our particular neighborhoods, not familiar with what's going on in other neighborhoods, mm -hmm. not having much contact with people in other areas. Here you are in Harlem, and you have issues uh, that need to be addressed, and you certainly be an outspoken over the years, protecting your community and protecting the larger community. Talk about things that uh, really matter most to the residents of Harlem, members of your church, uh, and the surrounding area. You know, Dr. Martin Luther King said, anything that affects you directly affects me indirectly, you know, and we are inextricably bound in a garment, a single garment of humanity, of, of, of mutuality. And so it, it really is in everybody's best interest as the city goes through whatever it goes through to recognize that we are really one, mm -hmm. you know, because as New Yorkers, we're, we're kind of crazy. <laughs> but the, the things that affect us in, in Harlem, particularly our education, the needs of, to educate our, our, this generation of students, not because the schools are bad. We spend more on educating teachers and educating students than any other industrialized nation in the world. And yet, at the end of the day, we rank 13th, 14th, 15th, or even at the bottom, closer to the bottom of all of those countries in terms of what our students produce. And it's not because the, 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 you know, we don't have facilities or the books or da 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 da, but our children aren't focused on, on where they need to be in education. And so there are a lot of issues. Um, a couple years ago, we, we, did a, we started a, a homework assistance program, and that was just the basic thing, uh, homework assistance. And we said, well, what can we do? Because our small church, small congregation is surrounded by 7,000 students, uh -huh. you know. And so we said, well, what can we do? Well, what is the thing, the number one need that students have that we can make a difference with? Homework. Homework. Teachers give it. Students don't do it. The students that do do it do better. So we said, well, let's give them a safe uh, a controlled environment, uh, assistance to be able to do that. We did that for just four months. And in four months, we took 10 students, just 10 students. Those 10 students all passed the state exam. They all were advanced to the next grade. And all of them, all of their teachers said that they were not going to pass and, and, and destined to fail the state exam, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All 10 passed. And then three of those students actually were, were offered special placement at special schools. Well, what's the moral of the story? It doesn't take that much. 
if we can just use common sense as citizens banding together to do what we can do, we got no state money, no city money. We didn't apply for any. We didn't need any. You know, we 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 we, we hired the tutors, and, and we you know our our our, our, our uh, youth director said, well, I'll, I'll put some extra time into to doing this. It became part of an extension of the, the, another youth program that we had. Those are the things that we have got to begin to do. We've got to get away. My philosophy is we can't ask government to do everything yeah. for us. We've got to do it for ourselves as citizens and, you know, coming together. I remember reading an article about Dr. Ben Carson, who's become nationally known, and he talks about growing up, uh, his mother used to check his homework because she had to check, on, check it off, and um, report cards had to sign it. Then when he got older, he learned his mother was illiterate. Right. Right? But the fact that his mother was engaged, involved, for him, that was, that was enough. And I was talking with uh, Borough President of Brooklyn, Eric Adams, recently, and I said, you know, we have kids who are going home to places where you don't have the conventional uh, the nuclear family. Right. Right? We got a parent or parents missing. Now you're asking a child to, you know, fulfill responsibilities given at the school to an area at home where you'd expect some parental oversight, you don't have it, how, there's a gap. So I'm thinking what you're doing, you're becoming almost surrogate parents in some cases, aren't you? Well, in, in some ways, but we really, the parenting responsibility is kind of a sacred right. So we, we, we there's a fine line, you know, what we, what we do. We want to do a family assistance. So we, we let it be known very clearly that we are not parents. We're only there to support the parents in, in their raising of those children. And by and large, what we found is most of those parents really do care about the kids. They, they, they're just too busy or they're illiterate or functionally illiterate and they feel overwhelmed. And so when we engage the students and they see that their students are doing better, they're, they're like, and now we're starting to reach, do a reach out, you know, it's kind of almost a reverse outreach you know so through the students through the children we're reaching out now to the parents and saying hey we can help you with job assistance we've got a we've got a, a uh, somebody donated a lot of computers for us so we have a computer learning center in the basement of our church and and uh, you know people can come there adults can come during the day and use it for resume assistance or for looking up you know looking at the internet to look, look up uh, for jobs and, and so forth and so those are again common sense just very basic things that uh, people need help with. And they make a tremendous difference because for us, you know, seeing these students that are going to, who are predicted to fail, do better, knowing that they're gonna graduate from high school, that they're gonna go on, and, and that many of them will live fruitful, productive lives. Well, There's nothing better. Isn't it interesting, you can take, and it's been shown, students, same background, put them in different educational settings and one group performs well and one group is just not going to make it because they don't have the kind of intervention that you're talking about. And these are simple, uh, non-complicated, you know, uh, areas. As, as we say, it's, it's not rocket science. It's caring. It's showing the students that someone cares for them. It's, it's it, you know, it's, it's, it's allowing them to know that, hey, you know, and listen, gifted students are going to do exceptional things. But what about the kid who's not gifted? Yeah. Or what about the kid that doesn't know that they're gifted or doesn't know that they, they have the ability to learn another language or, or two or they, 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 they're good in math? Or that kid that, that thinks that they're bad in math, what, what if you, know, you teach them a few little tricks that they get enough confidence to say, hey, I can do this. Unfortunately, teachers don't always have that kind of time to spend on every student because they're dealing with a whole myriad of other issues, social issues that 25 years ago teachers didn't have to deal with. Teachers could teach right. and students were expected to learn and parents were expected to support the teachers. Now if you know something happens in the classroom, the parents show up and in many cases, many cases, not all, the, the parent is uh, like saying, well, what did you do to my kid? Why, why you're supposed to teach them? You know, we, we've got it kind of twisted. And 
What we're trying to do, Rabbi, is we're trying to go back to those parents and back to those communities and the, t t the teachers, and we're trying to say, hey, listen, let's have a dialogue. Let's have a conversation around what needs to be done because we want your kid, we want you, we, we want your kid to grow up in an environment that's better. We just had a discussion with a rabbi, Elliot Costco, Park Avenue Synagogue, and he used the phrase portals of entry. Mm. And he said people come into congregations through different uh, entrances, right. right? Not everybody's going to come through the front door to the sanctuary. Right. And I'm thinking of all that your church is doing. What does that say about the responsibility of the church to the community? It's not just about a prayer service on Sunday. Right. And years ago, um, when I pastored my first congregation at uh, 93rd, 92nd in Amsterdam, a friend of mine, Harv Ostyk, he, he told me that. He said, well, how big is your congregation? And I told him how many people were coming on Sunday. He said, how big is your congregation? And I mentioned again, and I scratched my head. I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, your congregation is not the people who come to your church on Sunday. Your congregation, really, technically, is not all Christian. And they're not all people that, 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 that you know. And, and he began to show me. He said, listen, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people that you can impact in a positive way, in a way that honors God, that, that will allow the message of hope, the message of love, the message of salvation to be shared with those people without necessarily yeah. the religious structure of them coming into the, like you say, other portals of entry. But we have to show up, we have to care, and we have to be consistent with that. Maybe we need to change the definition of religious. Because so often when we define a person who's so-called religious, we look at certain rituals, we look at certain prayers, and we say, ah, oh, the person is a regular attendee. Right. That person's religious, right? The person keeps the dietary laws, Sabbath, that person's religious. But all the other things the right. person uh, does somehow doesn't get under, categorized under the aegis of religious. And what you're saying is, you know, there are people who fulfill religious mandates in different ways, and we need to recognize them. And... They make up the bigness of the congregation. Absolutely, absolutely. The, the story of the Good Samaritan comes to mind, you know, in which uh, Jesus tells a story of uh, the, the, you know, the, the person who needed help and, and uh, the, the priest goes by and the, the religious person goes by and finally it's this Samaritan that nobody liked, you know, that uh, was the outcast, social outcast. He stops and helps the, the, the person who is, you know, and, and takes them to the inn and, and, and so forth. And it, 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 it really is, it's not uh, how much you know, it's how much you care and how, how you're willing to demonstrate that caring. Years ago, uh, someone asked me for a letter of recommendation. Uh, when I was at the synagogue and I wrote a letter of recommendation, then the person went to the cantor for a letter of recommendation. Cantor wrote a letter of recommendation. <laughs> I got a call from the individual that says, you know, it's very nice you wrote these letters. Do you think there is someone who could tell us what the person does the rest of the week? You know, it's nice that you see the person once a week, but I, we want to know what else goes on in that person's life. Right. So I think we have to be very cognizant that religion uh, has a wider uh, reach than, than simply, uh, you know, that limited experience. Absolutely. You, uh, you do a number of things. You do them very well, which always reminds us that if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person. I have called on you many times to participate in demonstrations for Jewish causes. We've marched together at the United Nations protesting uh, on Iran, protesting against mistreatment in a host of other places. Uh, when there's an attack on Jews, you're right there. Um, what draws you uh, to the Jewish people? You know, I expect to see members of my community there. That's, that, that's where, you know, where we need to be as well. But to see others coming forward? and saying, your pain is my pain, where does that stem from? Well, for me, it, it begins with a spiritual conviction, you know, a religious belief. And, and I believe that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I used to have this poster up on my wall that says, my boss is a Jewish carpenter, <laughs> you know, that, that uh, uh, while Jesus, we believe, is Messiah, never stopped being Jewish. So you can't be truly Christian and anti-Semitic. And so I always got that. And I've always understood the Bible to say that Israel is God's chosen people. 
and I love the God of Israel. I serve the God of Israel. So, so for me, that's the foundation. But when you look at history, the Holocaust, and, and all of the genocidal aspects of the things that have gone on, anybody that's going to attack the Jewish people, guess who's they're going to attack next? Yeah, we the see Christians. That, right. And if they're attacking Christians, guess who they're going to attack next? The Jews. Because whether we understand our link or not, the world does. And so those who hate Jewish people will often hate Christians. You can't love one and, and not. So, so and from that connection. But then from a practical, I grew up and, you know, my, my grandmother, uh, you know, she cooked for a lot of the synagogues in, wow. in Baltimore. She, she grew up, in, you know, I grew up, in, my grandmother lived in Baltimore, my mother lived in Washington, D.C. And so I, I grew up around Jewish people. And I never had, to, and of course it was in the 60s, I never really could figure out, when I first came to New York and the, the whole Crown Heights thing, I was like, wait a minute, I always remember Jews and, 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 and black people, African Americans, being you know on the same side of the picket line. I, I always remember you know that that was you know in the civil rights movement. I always remember that we were together right. in unity on those things, and you know I'm, I'm old enough to have lived that, and so those things never though it was never really a strain for me. It was never so when I see and and especially now in the world politic, when I see. That, and, and I understand that, that you know, the, the, these threats against Israel, I'm biased toward Israel because I'm biased toward the God of Israel. And so it, it just, it disturbs me. And so I am unashamed, unabashedly a supporter of Israel. And then having gone, I've only been once, and my wife and I didn't go, you know, as part of a honeymoon, but we're, we're planning a, another trip there. But honestly, I fell in love. I, I wanted to make Aliyat, you know. I, wanted to, I mean, I really, I fell in love with the land. I fell in love with the people. It was just, it was just a wonderful experience for me. So that'll always, that'll always be who I am. It's not, I don't care if it's popular or not. It's just, it's just who I am and what I believe. I had a wonderful conversation with uh, Dr. Robert Stearns from Eagle's Wings. Uh, and he proudly is evangelical. And he said to the group the following, he says, I know that some of you, those in the Jewish community, you'll get nervous because you think <laughs> we hit to convert you, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so he says, so far, I haven't converted anybody. He says, but just imagine one day the Messiah arrives. We're going to have a press conference at the King David Hotel in Jerusalem. Right. And we're going to turn to the Messiah and say, would you answer this question? Is this your first time here or is this your second time here? And Stern says, I guarantee the Messiah will just say yes. yes. And somehow we're, we'll all feel fulfilled. Um, we need friends. And I think, you know, uh, we need greater outreach. We need to be there with one another, for one another. And uh, I can tell you, the New York Board of Rabbis, we have an ongoing relation with the evangelical community. It's, mm -hmm. it's wonderful. That doesn't mean we have to agree on everything. Right. You know, real dialogue is not predicated on agreement. I think real dialogue is predicated on the depth of disagreement. Because you know a mature relationship you can be honest. You can talk about what really troubles you. Right. Uh, but you also know at the end of the day when um, you're in trouble, that person is going to be there with you. You know, I don't know if that exists outside of New York. I've ne never lived in a place where it, it, it's been as strong. But I count you and the Jewish Board of Rabbis as one of my closest allies, one of the, one of the closest communities that I will always answer the call for. And many of my circle of evangelical pastors, we all feel the same way. Yeah. We all feel the same way. I mean, so in New York, at least, and, and you know, it was interesting, you know, I ran for office against, uh, uh, you know, ran for a congressional seat against uh, uh, Congressman Charles Rangel. And so in the Upper West Side, I was doing a lot of synagogues. And I was invited into a lot of synagogues. And they would invite me to speak. And I would speak and I would share my heart about Israel. And it was amazing, the outpouring of love and, and everything that I, that I felt. And I thought, wow, this is really great. You know, it, to, to, to feel at home and to, to not feel like an outsider in the community. I just don't know that outside of New York, yeah. you know, that that, that that exists. 
I think we take for granted, which is a good thing, the relationships we share with one another. Mm. Uh, we don't wait for a crisis, for an eruption to occur, uh, to all of a sudden come together. There are ongoing meetings. You know, we meet regularly with one another. So the friendship is established long before you know, the problem presents itself. And I, and I think New York may be unique that way. Someone was telling me that uh, in some of the areas where there were these explosions, you know, police, community, uh, there were calls made, well, who do we talk to? Who's, who are some of the faith leaders who are involved in this? And they said, gee, we don't know. Mm. Because you didn't have the established relationships right. pre-crisis. Right. So maybe New York can be emblematic. Maybe New York can be really a, a, a statement yeah. on what you need to do. Don't, don't wait till tomorrow to, to start uh, doing something. Right. And then, you know, you can't let other people pick your friends for you. Yeah, that's true. You, you, you yeah. know, you've got you to gotta stand by your convictions. Go by what, what you know and what, the people that you know. And, uh, you know, everybody is not going to be wonderful, whether they're, uh, uh, you know, evangelical or Jewish or Muslim, you know, but then they're, they're those people that you find that you can work with and that you, that, and, and that's the great thing is, you know, you, you talked about me uh, running for, for office for, for, for the, to be the mayor of the city of New York. I, I'm really running because I love this city. I'm running because you know, my plat people say, well, what's your platform? I said, well, I'm going to bring people together in, in this unity. My platform is one of unity. They say, well, is that all? I said, well, wait a minute. You don't understand New York. You don't understand how great this city is. You don't understand that this city has always been a beacon of hope for the world. Since you, you don't understand that this city has always, you know, uh, give us your poor, your, 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 your tired. tired you know, um, th this city has always had that beacon of hope for those who were disenfranchised. Now, do we always get it right? No, but that's the culture of this city. We really do believe it. And when you get us working together as one city, believing that, that, that cultural thread that, that brings us all together, it is a powerful force for good and to, I mean, look we, what we were able to do for, you know, after 9-11. Uh, you know, we were able to build the Empire State Building in the midst of the Depression. You know, the Verrazano Bridge, you know. And, I mean, it, none of these things are perfect. But we as a city, as a culture, when we come together and we can say, okay, we have to look out for those who don't have or who right. don't have as much as we do. It is so important that we understand that's part of the fabric of who New York is. And when we can take advantage of that, not to exploit it for division, to say that, you know, maybe it's a tale of two cities and, you know, yeah, there, there is a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots. But race is not the problem. You know, it, it, it's, it's that we need to come together and address some of the issues that, that fragment the, 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 you know, the, the, uh, the families who may be at the lower end of the socioeconomic uh, uh, totem pole, you know, it, and, and what is it that we can do, especially as a member of the faith community, what is it that we can do to strengthen these families and, and to get people to understand that they can do it if they have a desire to do it. So, you yeah. know. I remember you mentioned 9-11. Right after 9-11, we had a special ceremony at Yankee Stadium, and many of us as faith leaders sat on the bus going to Yankee Stadium. We were all together, and there was no special arrangement. You could sit wherever you wanted. And I sat next to a member of the Sikh community. And he was telling me about some of the uh, prejudice he had endured uh, right, uh, right after 9-11. But I thought of that bus ride. Here we were all going to the same place, right? Uh, later getting off at different stops. But ultimately, we had realized that there is this common mission. And right. I think we got to see each other. That way. Not everybody gets off in the same place, but uh, there's got to be a a place where we can all walk together and listen to each other and learn from each other. Before I let you go, we just have a few minutes left. Talk about police community relations, where you see this, where we are, where we can go. You know, I was part of uh, Mayor Giuliani's, you know, task force for police community relations. And during that time, we, we actually went to many, we, the, the, the entire task force, we touched every precinct in the city. We talked to various officers, people in the community, tremendous education. And several things I learned that are still true. One is, by and large, New Yorkers appreciate NYPD. Two, in my opinion, this is my opinion, I think New York's 
you know, NYPD is the best in the world at what they do. To, to, to you know, to, as a civilian peacekeeping force, they are unbelievable. Are there problems? Of course. I think what we have to do is begin as citizens to appreciate and affirm our police officers. As citizens, it's my right to say to that cop, hey, thanks, you're doing a good job. I mean, they're New Yorkers, yeah. you know? And, 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 you know, just to go up to them and say, hey, thanks, appreciate, you know, when you see, a, you know, in, in airports, sometimes, you, you, you know, you, you see people stop and they applaud military, you know, a military unit that's traveling through and say, thanks for your service. Hey, what about thanking these police officers, firefighters, first responders? They're, they're great in New York City. And I think we start with the positive, right. then we can, you know, the, the problems we can sort out. But that disconnect between the police and community is fatal. We can't allow it to happen, and we've got to correct that. Michael Faulkner, the Reverend, uh, let me just say, I'm looking at you, and right behind you there's an Israeli flag. And I think there's Michael Faulkner. He's a person who stands up for his people. He's a person who stands up for my people. He's a person who stands up for all people who need to hear that clear moral voice. So. Uh, we greatly appreciate all that you do and all that you are. Remember, we may have different faiths, we may have different faces, but above all, we must see each other as members of one human family. A great sage said, if you believe it can be broken, then no, it can also be fixed. When we speak faith to faith, we know we can find the right way to fix the problems of our world. Thank you for watching Faith to Faith, the place that leads to greater understanding. The New York Board of Rabbis would like to thank Marilyn and Marty Metz for their generous support. Thank you for watching Faith to Faith on JBS. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.